Now, you guys heard about Project Gift, and it's coming right around the corner. And this is such a big event that we want to get the whole church involved to reach out to the community, to give the homeless, the people in the, the kids in the hospital, all gifts for Christmas. So I'm going to wake up um, Junior and Aubrey, and they're going to talk more about it. Yeah, come on, give the Lord a clear, uh, clap offering. Give Jesus some praise. Come on, give us some praise. Hallelujah. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, I'm Junior. This is my beautiful wife, Aubrey. We are the Island Transformation Pastors. And we're doing Project Gift, like they said. Before I let my beautiful wife speak, just want to give God some glory because he's been doing a lot of things behind the scenes uh, by um, stirring up people to come and help us, uh, by stirring up people to, to give financially. Uh, a lot of people have stepped up and given donations for our silent auction. So I want to give God some glory because he's good. And he's good all the time to everybody and to us. So um, thank you for your attention. And uh, here's my wife. I'm going to sit down. I, I, you know what? I wanted to explain the why we're doing such a huge event. I, I, let me just tap on what it is on, on December 5th. So. Um, our whole vision was to be able to bless children that are in destitute situations. So those that are homeless, living in shelters, or those in the hospital. We want to be able to bless each child with a Christmas gift. Um, but in everything we're doing, I mean, when we got the call out to be Island Transformation Pastors, it's, it's got to start here, but it needs to go out into our community. And in everything we're doing, we want our community's mindset to start to change and start to take responsibility and ownership of this island and start to sow into this island. And, and so that's why we wanted to blow this up into an event that we can invite the community in. Um, I wanted it to be a draw to everyone so that they'd come. We got a big cakey zone. We were bringing in snow and all kinds of stuff for the kids. Um, we're having a surprise appearance from Queen Elsa. Um, just all kinds of stuff. We got uh, craft fair vendors, like 18 craft fair vendors, silent auction, entertainment. Of course, we got to have food. We got that. Um, but we got all this stuff to draw the community in, and that way they can sew by either donating a present or um, donating money so that we can go ahead and, and, and bless these kids. Um, eventually, there always needs to be the even bigger vision aside from this is to make this an annual thing and eventually reach out to just partner and sow into people that are making a difference in children's lives on this island so even beyond the homeless and stuff like that by next year we want to start partnering with other people that are really doing something positive for our kids um, so that's where we're going and that's the why of what we're doing um, but we definitely need some help so after service today I'm um, after encounter today I'm gonna have a table I got sign-up sheets most of I need gifts and time is what I need so I have um, different areas that we need help in a lot of our shifts are maybe one or two hours if you can contribute even an hour or two on that day I'd greatly appreciate it because we definitely need manpower um, I spoke about gifts so um, we're also having a country store, so if anybody can bake and do that kind of stuff, we need donations on baked goods and those kind of things that we want to resell. So, um, yeah, please come and see us. We definitely need help, and if you guys can just start to get involved. This is just the first of many things we're going to do. I believe this island can be transformed, but, you know, it just takes a small group of people to ignite a fire, and I believe that that fire is just going to spread across this island, and things are start going to start to manifest and change physically and we're going to be able to see the fruit of our labors so um yeah this is a call out to just get involved okay thank you so you guys oh so you guys please get involved this is not an island transformation thing this is a god's house thing so as a family let's rise up help out aubrey and jr Take off the stress of them. And let's do it as a family. To reach out to the community. To show God's love. Because that's what we're here for. To express God's love. We have one special video for you guys. And then Pastor Chris will be up. Hi. My name is Sarah Sato. And I love Steven 
too, but I'm not going to shave my head. However, there is one beloved member of God's house that has yet to participate in this act of solidarity for Steve, <laughs> David Lashua. So here we are on Oahu, and David has graciously agreed that even though I have eaten more food than I ever need to do in my lifetime, I will eat these two pieces of peanut butter bread, he will shave his head. So Stephen, even though I didn't shave my head, I love you, and I'm doing this for you. Okay, you're gonna, you're gonna like speed this up, right? Make John speed it up. Eat it chubby bunny style. No! <laughs> Why did you get fried? <laughs> Why did you get water? <laughs> oh my god, whatever it is. <laughs> No! <laughs> I can't wait to pour this to John. No, no, no. He's looking kind of nervous. I am. sweaty. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that was part of it. <laughs> I guess I will be bald tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes! I'm Sarah Sato. You're welcome, God's House Ohana. This is David Hashimoto. And this is for Steven! To learn more about Steven's story, or if you want to give to Steven, please visit GodsHouseMaui.com and click on Give to Steven. And never bet against Sarah Sato. We love you, Steven. That video in Oahu, I, uh, I took David, and, uh, who's our executive pastor, and Sarah, who's our graphic designer and part of our creative team with me. I spoke in a conference, uh, the Empowerment Conference in uh, uh, the Polynesian Cultural Center last week and took them with me to, uh, to help out with, uh, with uh, New Life Church and to, to help them with some of their, what they're doing. And I'm telling you, I, I pretty much, can we put it on this side? Yeah, I'm right-handed. I can't. I can't do this thing. Just, and I don't want to walk all day. I'm. I'm lazy. That's pretty much what it comes down to. And um, I pretty much decided that I, I. I. don't know that I can ever take David and Sarah anywhere with me again. They're crazy. But um. But uh, as you can see, David decided to finally. You know, I think some of you noticed that he was bald. And you're wondering what act of God could possibly happen that would make David shave off his, his beautifully quaffed and, and perfectly gelled masterpiece of a hairdo. 
And that's pretty much what it was, that, that it was Sarah hoovering down two massive yeast rolls covered in peanut butter, like slathered in peanut butter. It was amazing. Um, it, was, it was incredible. And, um, and I just wanted to say just once again, I mean, I can't say it enough. Thank you guys so much for supporting my brother um, through this. I have an update for you on him. Uh, I talked to my parents yesterday. Uh, again, we've just been getting daily updates. And um, he is awake. <laughs> so after about two weeks of being in a sedation-induced uh, coma because of the complications with his leukemia, uh, he's awake. He's actually able to uh, watch TV and uh, communicate with my parents through gesturing. He can nod his head. He's sitting up. And uh, everything, he still has a breathing tube in him. They're hoping to get that removed soon. Uh, but the biggest thing for you to know is that uh, if you know Steven, Steven is surgically attached to his phone. It's kind of amazing. You, you knew it was bad off when it, his phone, he wasn't on his phone. Um, you knew it was getting serious. But uh, and we know that God is working a miracle in his life and he is on his way to recovery because uh, as of a few days of, uh, ago, his hand is now surgically reattached to his phone. And uh, although he, he doesn't have the dexterity yet to be able to type and respond, he is able to use his thumb to scroll. So that means he's reading what you put down. So if you want to text him or if you have texted him or Facebooked him, he is able to read it. So, um, I, you know, if you just want to send him a message, send him a line, tell him that you love him, tell him that you're praying for him, that's very much appreciative, especially during this Thanksgiving week when he's not going to be able to be home. Uh, he's there in the ICU in uh, Kaiser Moanalua in Oahu. So I just want to say uh, uh, also too, uh, before I get into what we're talking about this morning, is Project Gift on December 5th. Everybody say December 5th. Everybody say 9 a.m. This is our first, this is God's house's first foray into reaching our island in a significant manner. And here at God's house, we don't believe in doing things small. We believe in dreaming big and dreaming God. And if you've seen the t-shirts, it's more than a slogan. We believe in dreaming God dreams. But dreaming never becomes reality unless people are there to put those dreams into action. It's not enough to give mental assent and say, hey, we're with you, and don't do anything to make it happen. God wants to do great things, and he wants to do it through you and me. And you might feel like you don't have a talent. You might feel like you don't have what it takes. You might say, I don't know how to do any of this stuff. I, I don't have any, any singing ability. I don't have anything to offer. But all God needs from you is what's in your two hands. Whatever it is that you have, that's all, that's all he needs. That's what he'll use. He took a boy with five loaves and two fishes, not enough to feed anybody, and he fed 5,000 people with it. See, because God will take your insufficiency and make it more than sufficient for everyone. What you think you have, what you think that you possess, and you look at it and go, that's insignificant compared to what other people have in their talents, that is exactly what God is going to use to change the world. There's no such thing as an insignificant person. There's no such thing as a worthless person. If you got two hands and a smile, we could use you for Project Gift. We're going to have boots set up. We're going to have all kinds of fun activities, a snow machine, so kids in Hawaii can experience snow. And it's free admission. It's for the entire island of Maui. We got food trucks coming, craft fair, silent auction, kid zone. And I want this to be a message from God's house to the entire island that we care about you. Anything that you can do is a gift given to the kingdom of God. I want you to look at a chair beside you if it's empty. I want you to look at an empty chair beside you. I want you to look at an empty chair beside you. And I want to ask you a question. How many of you have family members, friends, or coworkers that you look at and go, they need Jesus. I've been asked, why, why, do, why do you buy so much chairs? Why do you just put so much chairs out? I'll tell you why. Because every chair is not empty to me. I'm going to give you a little insight into me. We're going to talk about potential this morning. 
I was so excited to preach about this this morning. We're going to talk about potential. Every chair is a potential. Every chair is my investment into your family members, into your friends, into your coworkers. Every chair that we put out is an opportunity. Remember when we were buying chairs? What was it? Every chair is an opportunity. Every chair is an opportunity that we, we've laid out. But I don't know your friends. I don't know your family members. I don't know your coworkers. In fact, I can't go into your workplace and start inviting them to church one by one. They think I'm pretty weird. The kingdom of God was never meant to be a mission field where you went door to door to people that you didn't know and try to proselyte them into the kingdom. Hey, I don't know you, but I want you to join my religion. Hey, I don't care about you. I've never met you before in my life. You're nothing but a number to me, but we want to fill up our church. We want to, we want to grow the mission. The kingdom of God was always supposed to be a chain reaction set up by people who loved everyone about and around them so much that they got tired of seeing them live worthless, painful, faithless, hopeless, troubled lives. Lives without Jesus. Or maybe successful lives that ultimately have no meaning. And saying, hey, I love you enough. I love you so much. You're my friend. You're my family. I want to give you hope. See, you can't do that with a track in a Bible. You got to do that with love. And as we come into 2016, I'm on a mission in which I'm tired of playing the church game. I am tired of playing this game. And we are changing the game because I'm tired of playing by the rules of church and of religion that says we got to grow our church, that we got to do churchy things, that we show up on Sunday. Church is coming to church on Sunday. That's what it is. Dress nice. Put on clothes you never wear. Put on a smile that you never show the rest of the week. Put on the fakest you possible to come for two hours to church. And then we go back home and then we become ourselves again. We're on a mission. And I want you to get on this mission with me. I want you to be the potential for a whole generation of people on this island who are going to come to know him. I cannot communicate to you enough how tired I am of doing church. Nice church. Safe church. I'm so done. And I'm ready to jump down this rabbit hole. Follow God wherever he's going. Do some insanely crazy stuff. and see what happens. And I want to fill every chair in here, not because that makes us a big church. I want to fill every chair in here because every chair represents somebody you know who needs Him. Somebody who needs to be healed of the disease. Somebody who needs to be reconciled with their ch child. Somebody who needs hope. And you are the carriers of the cure for culture. You are the cure for culture. Because Jesus Christ lives in you. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. I don't know if I'm missing something, but I'll probably need a dry erase marker as well. Yeah, like my, um, 
dry erase marker in my finger is not one of my spiritual gift keys. Y'all can laugh, y'all. Man, what, what's going on today? <laughs> so serious this morning. I know what it is. Janice is playing too pretty music. Can you play something like, like circus music or something? Janice is like, what is that? I have never been to a circus before in my life. I've never laughed before. What are you talking about? This is, this is my circus music. What are you talking about? I work at DMV. If you're at Genesis chapter 1, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 26. And then I want you to turn uh, and put your pinky finger in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Thanks. So we're going to start at Genesis chapter 1, but then we're going to go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Is everybody there? Ecclesiastes. Book after Proverbs which is the book after Psalms, which is pretty much the book that everybody knows in the Bible. Go to Psalms, take a right turn, go down two blocks, you'll be at Ecclesiastes. Is everybody there? If you're there, say, oh yeah. All right, so Genesis chapter 1, starting at verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on, creeps on the earth. Notice that he speaks in generalities about everything. All the fish, all the animals, everything on the earth. But at the very end, he, he, he points out, he takes special care to point out creeping things, which is very specific. It's as if he knows that the temptation that's coming up, he gives you a hint as to what's coming up that he's going to have to subdue. The enemy comes as a serpent, as a snake, a creeping thing. See, there's nothing you'll ever go through in life that's really a surprise. Some of you are acting all surprised at what's coming down the pipe, what you're going through right now, and you're being caught by surprise about some things. But God always gives you a hint of what you're about to go through. And what you're about to go through is never to break you, it's to make you. It's the necessary test that you're supposed to pass. So God, in verse 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. Actually, you know what? Let's start at verse 9. What profit has the worker from that in which he labors? I have seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Look at the person next to you and say, you're beautiful. Wow, there's some laughter here. Look at him again and say, God is making you beautiful in his time. Don't worry if you're not beautiful yet. He's making you beautiful in his time. Some of you taking a little bit longer than others, but it's okay. Me most of all, I'm wearing purple pants or red pants or whatever you call it today. I've had people be like, I like your purple pants. And other people are like, I like your red pants. I don't even know what it is. Fuchsia. Yeah. I have to distract you in my purple pants because God is still making me beautiful in his time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would just fill me with your words. Make me your mouthpiece, your megaphone, your microphone. 
Wear me like a coat, God. Put me on. Let me be a reflection of you. God, I pray that your words would be life to us. Father, I speak not only to the people who are sitting in the chair today, but I speak to all the potential of every person that has not filled this, these chairs yet in the natural, but they are filled already in your will. Change our lives. Make us yours. We belong to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today I want to talk about potential. This is a buzzword in today's world. Everybody wants to talk about potential. And the reason why we like potential is that potential gives us hope that there's something for us that is in front of us that we don't see yet. And as long as you have potential, you have, you, you have hope. And so when you're young, we talk about potential. He has so much potential. You see, when you, look, when you watch sports, you see a rookie, and a rookie comes along, and he plays really well, and he's not there yet, but you look at him and go, he has a lot of potential. And we love potential. And the, and the, the dictionary defines potential with two different ways. Number one, it's having or showing the capacity to become or develop something in the future. The ability or capacity for something to become what it's not yet, but it can be. And the other definition is a latent quality or ability that may be developed and lead to future success or usefulness. So not only is it the capacity to become something, it is the power of that of that thing inside of you hidden potential everyone is born in this life with God given potential and the Bible says that God created you and me man and woman and he said I want you to be fruitful and to multiply because you've been made in my image you've been made with the ability with the power inside of you to be able to fulfill everything that God has put in your heart Everything that Jesus died for, you have the ability inside of you. From the moment you were born, God knew your destiny. He placed it inside of you. And then he put inside of you all of the ability, all of the power, all of the acumen, all of the skill, all of the potential that you needed to be everything he's called you to be. That's why your walk in Christ is not about you obtaining things from the outside to fulfill you but it's discovering what's already on the inside of you to become. That's why it's a fruitless life that whether you know Jesus or not, for you to live your everyday life trying to accumulate things, accumulate friendships, accumulate wealth, accumulate positions and status, accumulate, accumulate, accumulate material things, emotional things, mental things, relational things on the outside of you, to try to fulfill what only God can fill on the inside of you. That's why some of you have moved from place to place to place to place. You've been in relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship, job to job to job to job. You've gone after degree after degree after degree. Some of you have changed your major 16 times and haven't finished college because you couldn't figure out what you wanted to do. Because none of it seems to fulfill you. And instead of going to college to walk out a God-given destiny and a calling that goes beyond what you feel like in the moment, you're trying to find meaning in life in a piece of paper that can't possibly sustain you. But it's all this chase to find the potential inside of you. Every single one of you knows there's something inside of you. And the frustration of life is because most of the people out, most of you are living lives in which you know there's something inside of you, but you just can't seem to get it out. And you come to Christ and he says, follow me. I will show you who you are. Everything you've been looking for is not on the outside of you, it's on the inside of you. 
Everything you need is not on the outside of you. It's on the inside of you. It is locked up like a, like a treasure chest with a lock on it deep inside of your heart. And he says, I'm the key. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. I'm going to unlock these things from inside of you. But in order for you to realize potential, you can't. The reason why it's potential is because although it's inside of you, you are not yet matured to be the person that you need to be to walk out that potential. For example, in Galatians, Paul talks about heirs, like H-E-I-R-S, heirs, like heir to the throne, like a prince. And he talks about a prince, and he talks about a slave. And he says when a prince, when an heir to a throne is a child, he's no different from a slave. He has to follow all the rules. He has a tutor chasing behind him, telling him, you need to do school. You need to eat now. You need to go to bed. You need to take a bath. And that prince might be the heir. Inside of him is the potential to be the ruler of an entire kingdom. But while he's a child, he's immature, he can't be trusted with all of that power. He has to grow into it. So when he's a child, he's no different from a slave. He has to be told what to do. He has all of that potential inside of it. He doesn't need to do a single thing except grow up to be the king. He doesn't need to get plastic surgery. He doesn't need to buy new clothes. He doesn't need to, to do anything else, change his name, marry the right person. He doesn't need to do any of that. All he has to do is grow into the person he's supposed to be, to become a, an adult, a mature individual, and the kingdom is his. So potential is tied to process. Potential never becomes promise without the process. But the problem with potential is that we all want to realize potential, but we do not want to walk through process. The process of becoming. If you've ever raised a child, you know this to be true. If you've ever raised a teenager, you know this to be absolutely true. My three oldest daughters are 13, 12, and 11. Sometimes things come out of their mouth when I tell them to do something, and I'm like, whoa, where is my sweet child gone? Who snatched up my beautifully sweet daughter and replaced her with a walking Justin Bieber. <laughs> potential is never meant to stay potential. Potential, the word potential comes from a root word, potent. Is it okay if I give you a little bit of an English lesson? To set up where we're going. Potential, the word potential comes from the word potent. Now, potent means having great power, influence, or effect. I want you to hear this. Potential means the ability or capacity to become something powerful. But it comes from this root word, potential, comes from this word potent that means already possessing great power. It's already inside of you. It's already there. So potent is power. Can everybody see this? You guys see it? You guys see it? Potent is power. But potent is not just power. It's not physical exertion or doing power. It is actually having and possessing and being power. If you're potent, that means the power is not something outside of you that you show off or exert or that is enacted upon you. 
Potent means the power is latent inside of you. Latent means existing but not yet developed or manifest, hidden or concealed. Potent means the power is latent, it's hidden inside of you. If you watch comic books, Bruce Banner is potent. Why? He's walking around looking like an ordinary human, but if you make him angry, that power latent inside of him makes him potent. Every single one of you, when God says you have God-given potential, that there is inside of you in Ecclesiastes when it says, I know, I have seen, Solomon says, I have seen the work that the sons of men, all of us, are called to do. And God has placed eternity inside of you. What he's saying is that the potential inside of you, because of Christ in you, the hope of glory, is that the potential is limitless. It is eternal. And it's so much so that inside of you, you could not possibly know the work from end to beginning, from beginning to end. You cannot possibly understand what God has put inside of you. Because you are potent. You are powerful. Enough with this Christianity that says, I am not powerful enough to be everything God has called me to be. It is time. What I am doing, and this is the scary part about talking about potential today. What I'm talking about today removes the excuse from us to ever live life again where you're looking and going, I just, I'm just powerless. I just, I just can't change. This is not rules and regulation Christianity. Dress nice. Don't swear. Don't have sex before marriage. Read your Bible. Pray. Come to church. And you're a good Christian. You can do all of those things. And it doesn't matter. Because you might be following some rules. But on the inside of you, you're not realizing the potential God's put inside of you. Colossians 3, 1 through 4 says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. I want you to put that on the screen. Colossians 3. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Latent means hidden. You are hidden in God. I'm about to flip this script real quick. We were talking about how Christ in you is the potential, the potent, the power latent in you to be everything he's called you to be. You have Christ in you. I want you to catch this. You, you, you who look in the mirror every day and feel powerless to walk out your life, who feel powerless so much of the time, he is in you. He is the power latent in you. But then Paul says in relationship to him, you are the power latent in Christ. You are hidden in Him. You are the one latent in Him. You are His potential. Oh my God. It 
Some of you are looking and saying, God, why aren't you doing this? Why? I thought you were powerful enough to take authority over these things in my life, over this, over the lust in my life, over, over the struggle in my life. I thought you were powerful enough to save my whole family. I thought you were powerful enough to save my coworkers. I thought you were my potential. And God says, no, you're my potential. I am powerful enough. But you're the, you're the one. You're the power. Man, I wish you could get what I'm saying. You are the one. You carry my spirit in you. You are hidden in me. You are the latent power in me. You're waiting on me, but I have been waiting on you. You're waiting on God to enact his destiny in your life. He already did it. He got on a cross 2,000 years ago. And the very last word he said before he went to hell and kicked the devil's rear, he said, it is finished. It's done. I did my part. I've unlocked the potential. The potential is you. That's why he said, I have to go away. Why? He was done. But he says, it's better that I go away because the Holy Spirit's going to live in you. And when the Holy Spirit comes and lives in you, you become the walking out. You become the power of God on the earth. Don't tell God to save any family members that you're not willing to go out on a limb and witness to. Stop praying for people at work to come to know Jesus when you ain't talking to a single one of them. Don't blame God for why your workplace is the way it is when you act in just as much like the world as they do. Stop talking to God about sending you Mr. Right when all you do is give Mr. Wrong attention. Stop talking to God about how he, you want him to supply all of your needs when you take your tithe to go watch Hunger Games every week. It was good, by the way. I did not use my tithe money to do it. You are the potential. You are the potential. Jesus did all the work. He broke all the chains. He broke all the strongholds. He said, loose all the captives. And all that is left to do is to walk it out. And he left us on the earth to do it. And so the enemy, what he's made his mission for 2,000 years to do is to get you to believe that there is no potential. You are not potential. You are not powerful. That is not latent in you. And not only does he say that you have potential, he says you have eternity inside of you. I want to give you a little picture of eternity. I want you to imagine for a second that forklifts pulled up, or not forklifts, but uh, uh, tractors pulled up. And they began to dump dirt and fill up this entire auditorium. And fill it up with dirt all the way to the top. Imagine this entire place filled with dirt. All the way to the very top. Now, this is such an inadequate analogy as to the nature of eternity. But this will have to do. Imagine. Is everybody imagining that? Can you see it? How much dirt is that? A lot. Filled to the brim. This entire thing. Packed to the hill. Now, I went out there and I picked out one piece of dirt. It's sitting on my hand. It's sitting on my finger. It's so small, I have a hard time seeing it. It's a speck. 
Am I telling the truth? Look. Yes. Yeah? How big is that? It's tiny. Now, this entire auditorium filled with dirt. Imagine that that's eternity. And this speck sitting on my finger that is so small That represents your lifetime on this earth. Now the Bible says that Jesus came to bring eternal life. He came to give you this. The problem is all we ever want to concentrate on is this. But you have the potential for this. But you wake up every day worried about this. And we walk along our entire day, and this is what we do. God, I just don't see your destiny for my life. God, I thought you said that you were going to do all these things in my life. I just don't see it. God, I'm waiting for you. Where are you, God? I just, I, just don't, I just don't see you doing anything. And God is doing all of this on the earth. Eternal things. But we're so sucked up into this. We can't see it. And what we do is we take eternal things and we try to fit it into this life. When this life is nothing more than a speck of dust, it's a vapor, it's a breath, and then it's gone in the scheme of eternity. But you will make all your financial decisions, all your personal decisions, We'll say, God, I trust you for my finances. We'll get up for work five times a week at 6 a.m. and be on time. We can't show up at 10 o'clock one time during the week to worship him. We're focused on the speck. You are God's potential on the earth, and God has to get us out of this and get us into this. When we talk about Project Gift, Project Gift has nothing to do with this. It has everything to do with this. But let me give you a hint. If you'll just step out of this and get into this, what you'll find is that this is inside of this. And if I'll just jump into him, into being his potential, What you'll find is that God will fulfill all of this and you won't even be looking. I have a vision. When we came back to Maui, I grew up here my whole life. I know how to do church on Maui. I've done it my whole life. I don't care if this makes me politically incorrect. I don't care if it makes me an enemy. I don't care what. I don't care if people say I'm not playing nice. I am so tired of us having big churches, small churches, churches everywhere. And we all have our good time in church. We accept the people we like and we don't expe- accept the people we don't like. 
And when people don't look like us, they don't act like us, they don't talk like us, then we say, I love you with the love of Jesus, but we don't really love them in our own hearts. And we cover it up with Bible verses and smiles. I'm so tired of us being a church that's not reaching our potential. Hear me, I'm not mad, I'm not exasperated, I'm just being realistic. I, I, I want us to, we are the potential of God on this island. We are His potential. We're not waiting for Him as much as He's waiting on us. Waiting for us to get out of our lives, to get out of our worries, to get out of our cares, to get out of our preferences, to get out of our convenience, and, and to say, you know what, God, I'm all in. I am all in. I am yours. Every moment of every day, I'm, I'm yours. And I'm going to give myself to a cause that's bigger than me. There's another definition for the word potent. And speaking in terms of a man, it's his ability to reproduce. If a man has the ability to reproduce, inside of him is the seed of reproduction. When God made man, he just made him. He just made Adam, right? But then he looked, and in a world in which he looked at everything and said, it is good, it is good, it is good. The only thing he said wasn't good was that man be alone. The only thing that wasn't good was that man be all one. Alone. So he takes man, he puts him to sleep. See, some of you got to be, you got to stop being in such a rush to do everything. God's trying to tell you to wait, sit, rest. And he's trying to produce in you something good. But we don't want to sit still. We can't handle just sitting. We can't handle it when nothing's happening. When nothing's happening, we feel like nothing's going on. We want to get up and we want to go and go, God, it's not working. You're not doing anything. God's trying to put you to sleep. And out of man, he creates woman. And he takes out of man who is complete. And he creates a woman. He puts the womb in her. So now man's not capable of producing on his own. You know why a Christianity in which you go, I don't need to go to church, I don't need the church, I just have church by myself in my house. You know why that'll get you to heaven? You know why that'll get you there? But you'll always feel incomplete and alone? Because you were not meant to be all one. We are in this together. And we have no ability to produce anything in our lives by ourselves. We're not designed that way. Now the man has the potency. The woman is just the soil. The man produces, provides the seed. And in him is the power of reproduction. That's what makes him potent. Now if a man is impotent, it's that he doesn't have the ability to produce. He can do the act. He can do all the stuff. He is not able to actually produce anything out of his actions. See, some of us, the reason why you feel impotent is because you are doing all of the action, doing all of the stuff. You don't feel like you have any of the power to produce. But see, the Bible says that we are the bride of Christ. We're the womb. We're the woman. But the Bible says that Jesus is the groom. That means all the power of potential is in him. And all you have to do is be open to receive and allow him to have his process in your life. And you will produce.
his potential. But this time of halfway Christianity is done. This time of I'll commit some but not all is over. And you say, well, but you don't understand what I've been through. You don't understand where I've been. You don't know how hard it is. I don't. But he does. And he knew everything you were going to go through when he made you. And you may believe that you haven't made it. You may believe that your struggle has been greater than you. But I look around this room and I see a bunch of people that no matter what you've been through, no matter what has been thrown your way, you are here right now. You're not a survivor. You're not an overcomer. Paul says you're more than that. You're more than an overcomer in Jesus Christ. And I want to be the sound of a voice calling a new generation. That says that we are committed to realizing all the potential that God has put in us. Individually and collectively. I want to ask you to go all in with me. We live in a state, we live in on, on an island where this is optional. The things of God are options, not necessities. All the while, we walk around our week and we make optional things, necessities for us. I want to ask you to go all in with me. We're not perfect. But we have an unrelenting desire to see God move on our island. And I cannot do this alone. I want to do it with you. Because we are the potential of God. He lives in you. Everybody stand up on your feet. Stand up with me. Potential is power. Latent, hidden. In English, when you put I-A-L at the end of any word, what you're saying is it's encompassed by or connected to. It means all. All. All encompassing. All connected. Potential. is when you're connected to a source of power latent in you. John 15, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me and I abide in you, you'll bear fruit. The other day I was trying to charge my phone, my phone was about to die. You know there's nothing more, you know there's no anxiety in this world today greater than when you look at your phone and realize that you only have 4% left but you still got about half the day to go. You're putting it in power saver mode. You're closing all your apps. You make the screen dimmer so you can barely read it. 
but you're conserving battery. Y'all know what I'm talking about. So I went into my bedroom, and I have a charger there, and I plugged it in, and then I left it. And then I came back about 30 minutes later, expecting to find it charged, and it, it had not gone up at all. It was like at 3%. So I start play, I pull it out and I plug it in again. Nothing. So I take it out, I restart my phone, I turn it back on, and then I, I plug it in, nothing. So I'm like taking off the case, I'm blowing in the port, <laughs> wiping off the connection, the connector on the, on the charger, and then I plug it back in and then nothing. So I'm worried now. What am I going to do about my phone? I'm like, I'm going to have to get it. So I go looking all over the place for a new charger, for, for a new one. I'm asking the girls, where's your iPod charger? Can I, can I get your charger? Can I get your charger? They're like, why, Daddy? Justin Bieber's, little Justin Bieber's, I'm telling you. So I go back in, and I'm like, man, my, my charger's not working. So I plug it in again, and nothing. So finally, one of my daughters comes in. She goes, here, Daddy, you can use my charger. So I take her charger cord, and I go to, you know, you know you have the thing that plugs into the wall, the little box thing? So I go to change out the cord and I go to put it in the box thing and I realize and I look down and the box thing is not even plugged in. Y'all have done this. Y'all have done this. Y'all know you have done this. And so I just take it and I plug the box in. I don't change the cord or nothing. I just plug the box in, plug it up to my phone. And unbelievably, the little lightning symbol comes out. Salvation. See, the problem wasn't in the cord. The problem wasn't in the phone. The problem wasn't in the design or the mechanism. See, I was looking at, I want you to hear this. I was looking at the cord saying, what's wrong with the cord? See, some of you look in the mirror every day and say, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? See, the problem's not in the design. The problem was that it wasn't plugged in. This means connected to, plugged in. The only way potential becomes reality is if you plug in. God wants all. Potential. All. All. So everybody here, I just want you to close your eyes. I'm just going to ask you a simple question. If you're tired of talking about potential, and you say, God, I'm ready to be your reality. I want to be your power on the earth. I don't want to do nice things. I don't want to live nice life. I want all, and I'm ready to give all. I'm ready to be. We're ready to change the world. I just want you to raise your hand. It's beautiful. I'm just going to pray over you this morning. Saying, why, why are you just going to pray a prayer over us? Why aren't you going to have us come up? And why aren't you going to lay hands on me or any of those things? Because the truth is, He's already in you. And you're already in Him. You can put your hands down. I'm going to pray over you in a second. Now, if you're here today, and you say, you know what, Chris? I want all of this, but the truth is, I'm not plugged in. I'm not even connected to God. I want to know Jesus. I'm ready to have a relationship with Him. If that's you, then I want you to raise your hand. I want a relationship with Him.
Wow. You can put your hands down. Father, I just pray for every person who just raised their hand. I pray, Father, right here, your presence would fill this room. If you just raised your hand and said, I want relationship with Jesus, I want you to just come up. Come up here. I want to I wanna pray with you. This is the real deal. This is the real deal. Ain't it powerful that you can go to your church your whole life and not really feel like you know him? Isn't that crazy? Can I get the worship team? If I can get a few pastors to come pray. Now, I'm not going to ask you to repeat a prayer after me, okay? I'm so tired of Hallmark salvation. (laughs) All right? This is what we're going to do. Worship team is going to sing a song. We're going to pray for you. But when I read my Bible, I see a Jesus who wanted to hear two words from you when he wanted to hear you repeat 20 words after me. So I want you to tell him what you want. He's here. He wants to know you. We're going to be here to help you. Get the words out of your mouth you want to get out. But I want you to just close your eyes. And I want you to picture Jesus standing right in front of you. He's standing in front of you right now. Like your mom or your dad or somebody that you love. And I want you to picture him standing in front of you and I want you to just tell him whatever you want to tell him. And then I want you to listen to him as he tells you the things he wants to tell you. And this is what I want the rest of us to do. I'm going to pray for all of you because there was a lot of hands that went up. And I want you, I want you to pray for one another. I'm going to have you just pray for one another, okay? Just get together in groups of like three or four. It doesn't have to take long. It can be five minutes. It can be whatever. You're like, what? That's uncomfortable. That's crazy. Yeah. To pray for each other. Everybody just stand up. Close your eyes. We don't need music to do this. (laughs) We don't need music to do this. There are a lot of hands that went up. There's a lot of potential in this room. 